Coming up on Business Incorporated. International Monetary Fund says emerging markets expected to lose 30% of capital inflows amid the Ukrainian war. And South African RAND falls to nearly four week low. Plus, 100 Nigerians get UN WTO Tourism Scholarship Awards. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Ladi Williams. First off, let's take a look at the markets. To start the show uh, with market numbers from Africa, it was uh, mostly uh, mixed sentiment with South Africa uh, leading the uh, top gainers see, by over half a percentage point, while Nigeria's index uh, trails from afar with a 0.03% gain. Uh, on the flip side, EGX that he shed almost 2%, while Kenya closed Tuesday's uh, trade down more than half a percent. And in the Middle East, markets we follow were all positive. The Abu Dhabi market was on a bullish run intraday, gaining 0.85%. Dubai was uh, also in positive region, uh, though um, by marginal gain. In another region, Saudi Arabia was up almost 1%, while uh, the Qatari index, uh, index fell behind uh, the positive at 0.07 percent. All right, now let's head on to Europe. New, uh, new data out today indicates uh, how the war in Ukraine is impacting the European economy. Well, we have uh, Chelsea Delaney joining us right there from Berlin. Great to have you, Chelsea. Well, uh, Germany announced producer prices surged by a record 31 percent in March uh, from a year earlier. What drove that massive increase? It's largely being driven by energy prices. Uh, energy prices were up 84% in March from a year earlier. That's obviously uh, has a lot to do with the war in Ukraine. The EU is extremely dependent on Russia for energy sources, particularly natural gas, but also oil. And there are a lot of concerns now that those flows will be disrupted because of the war. Um, natural gas is really where we're seeing this the most. Prices were up 145% from a year earlier. And, and natural gas is really a crucial energy source for Germany in particular. These industrial players use a lot of natural gas to keep their factories flowing, uh, going. So that's a major issue. But it's not just energy. Uh, metal prices were also up about 40 percent, fertilizer prices 87 percent, wooden containers up 67 percent, uh, and vegetable oils up 72 percent. So you can see how all across supply chains here in, in, in Germany, prices are rising significantly. And it's important always to note with this data, it's producer prices. So it's the prices that businesses are paying um, for the goods that they use to operate their businesses. But you can see how much more expensive it's getting, for example, to run a restaurant with those cooking oil or flour prices surging, or to make steel or any industrial goods, even to ship um, the, these goods. The logistics are also just really getting getting much more expensive now because of the war. Yeah, it is getting uh, pretty expensive uh, pr uh, production. Uh, but, you know, inflation for consumers is also, you know, surging. Does this report indicate, you know, it's about to get worse? So the 30% won't get fully passed on to consumers, but some of it will. Um, we already have the data for consumer prices in, in March in Germany. They were up 7.2%, so about a fourth of the producer price increase. And there had been a lot of talk in recent weeks about whether inflation uh, had peaked, but I'd say this data indicates that it hasn't, especially here in Germany. Uh, producer prices in general are thought to be an indicator, so really a predictor of where consumer prices are going. Um, so your Siemens and, and you're making a washing machine, uh, the metal that goes into that machine, the energy to keep your factory going, even the box to ship it in, uh, those have surged in price. And it's going to take a bit of time for a company like Siemens to pass on those prices to consumers. They don't immediately raise them. But if we're seeing companies uh, face 31% higher prices in March, it does suggest that they will need to raise prices for consumers in the months ahead. Meanwhile, uh, data indicates that the EU auto sector is also suffering, you know, due to the war with uh, new car registrations falling by 20% in March. Walk us through this uh, report. 
Yes, it's another bad month for the European auto sector. It's actually the ninth straight month of declines uh, for new car registrations. And so even before March, even before the war in Ukraine, uh, automakers were struggling, particularly with semiconductor shortages. A lot of uh, big automakers here in Europe had to shut down production in parts of last year because they just couldn't get enough uh, semiconductors. Those problems continue. And now you have the war in Ukraine, uh, which has made things more complicated for European automakers. Many had factories either in Ukraine Ukraine and Russia that they've had to shut. Um, VW sales were down about 15% in March. Stellantis, Stellantis, which is the company that owns Peugeot, or Chrysler down 22%. Some of the luxury automakers did a bit better. BMW and Mercedes were uh, only saw an 11% decline. But uh, this certainly is going to dash hopes that a lot of automakers had coming into this year that 2022, they would start to see uh, a recovery as, as supply chain issues um, started to ease. All of that is definitely off the table now. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Chelsea. That's Chelsea Delaney right there in Berlin. Thanks for the update. All right. Now, uh, moving on uh, to the UK, we have uh, Juliana uh, right there. Great to have you, Juliana. Well, Just Eat Takeaway is uh, considering selling off its uh, Grubhub arm after reporting a decline in orders compared to bumper levels during the COVID uh, lockdowns. It looks like loss of appetite for Just Eat. Yeah, that's a, a good pun, uh, laddie. And sadly, it's true uh, for JustEatTakeaway.com, which is a European-based food delivery firm. And now they've updated investors uh, for their Q1 uh, results. And unfortunately for them, um, they are just the latest um, kind of online firm to show that consumer habits is changing and it's affecting their bottom line. I think really the big news, obviously, is about Netflix overnight uh, completely taking uh, Wall Street by surprise by showing the for the first time in 10 years, they lost 200,000 subscribers. And it's not just in streaming, it is in food delivery. Um, in the first uh, three months of this year, uh, sales are down by about 1% in uh, Just Eat uh, Takeaway.com, and this has been led by a 5% decline in North America, which is why uh, we've seen some of their activist investors urging them to kind of drop uh, the Grub Hub uh, US unit, which was purchased only a year ago for about $7.5 billion, but it's not uh, bringing them any profit. They're really um, uh, in a squeeze uh, right now, and they have warned investors that it is going to be much tougher uh, for times to come. There is so many uh, competitors in the food delivery app uh, business. I'm sure you've got your favourites, Laddie. I do too. Right. And some people uh, chop and change. Uh, but they have decided uh, that they will try and seek a partner. And because of that announcement, their shares uh, were slightly lifted um, in the FTSE uh, 100 this morning when they made that announcement. Yeah, it looks like, you know, lockdown, the stocks are taking a beating, you know, at this point. But, you know, after a sharp post-Brexit uh, decline, Ireland's largest port recorded a rebound in uh, freight volumes to and from the UK during the first uh, quarter of this year. What are you hearing about this? Yeah, this is a, a positive uh, story uh, for uh, Brexiteers. Uh, Dublin port um, is uh, the largest port um, in Ireland. In fact, I believe about four fifths of uh, freight passes uh, through that port. And they've just released some data showing uh, that in the first quarter of this year, uh, freight trade between the UK and that port is up by 23%. Uh, and this is a, a, an important story because, of course, we know uh, that when uh, the UK officially left uh, the European Union in January 2021, there was a huge slump. I believe a trade slumped by about 15%. Now, it's still not at pre Brexit levels, really difficult to try and differentiate between pre-Brexit and pre-COVID, but pre-Brexit <laughs> levels um, are still 8% lower. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a positive story. We know there's been so much uh, back and forth and toing and throwing between Whitehall and Brussels over that uh, uh, small bit of water between the United Kingdom and Ireland, the Irish Sea. Uh, but at least in terms of freight volumes, uh, they're getting um, to become a much better positive uh, robust bust place um, as they were pre-COVID, pre-Brexit. Pre-COVID, pre-Brexit. Thank you so much. Now, well, how are the markets uh, looking right now? 
Not bad. So despite um, that gloomy outlook we got from the IMF over the weekend, suggesting uh, that global economic output is going to fall, um, and of course we've still got that barbaric uh, war, haven't we, going on in Ukraine. It seems like uh, investors have recovered some of the losses um, that uh, took place yesterday. The FTSE All share is up at intraday by 0.27%. The FTSE 100 also up by 0.13%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market, up too by 0.3%. 3.6%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading up against the US dollar by 0.34%, though trading down against the euro by 0.14% and down too against the Japanese yen by 0.83% at intraday, laddie. All right. It's all about global economic uh, projections, you know, at this time. Thanks so much, uh, Juliana. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. All right, now let's take a look at uh, what's happening in Asia. We see shares in uh, Asia, uh, Asia Pacific were mixed, you know, uh, defied expectations by keeping its uh, benchmark uh, lending rates on chain. That's China. Mainly Chinese stocks led losses among the region's major markets. Shanghai uh, Composite closed 1.35% lower at 3,151 points, while the Shenzhen component uh, declined 2.07% to 11,392 points. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index shared uh, earlier gains, was down 0.44% uh, as of its final hour of trading, adding to its uh, more than 2% uh, Tuesday loss. The Nikkei 225 in Japan uh, climbed 0.86% to close at 27,217 points, while the Topics uh, Index advanced 1.03% uh, to 1,915. Australian stocks uh, nudged higher as the S&P ASX 200 saw fractional gains on the day to 7,569 points, while South Korea's cost be ended the uh, trading day little change at 2,718 points. And over to the U.S., S&P uh, 500 futures were little changed uh, today as investors digested disappointing Netflix uh, earnings along with a host of other corporate uh, reports that helped pull the other major in, uh, indexes in uh, opposite directions. Futures tied to the broad uh, market index were just 0.01% uh, lower. Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, futures were up 47 points, uh, which helped uh, buy strong earnings from uh, Procter & Gamble. Well, NASDAQ 100 uh, futures lost 0.2%. And over to the oil market, you see oil prices rebounded. Today as a drop in U.S. oil inventories and concerns over tighter supplies from Russia and Libya drove a, a recovery from a previous session's uh, sharp losses. Uh, Brent crude futures rose 66 cents to $107.91 uh, a barrel. Uh, the front month uh, WTI crude uh, futures contract, which expires on uh, Wednesday today, rose 78 cents to $103.34, while the second month contract gained uh, 69 cents to 102 dollars uh, 74 cents uh, the two main benchmarks had fallen by 5.2 percent in volatile trading uh, yesterday after the international monetary fund caught its forecast uh, global growth uh, forecast by nearly a full percentage point citing the economic impact of russia's war in ukraine and warning that inflation had become a clear and present danger for many countries and gold prices hit a more than one week low today as a firmer U.S. dollar and Treasury yields continue to weigh on the bullion's demand. Spot gold is down 0.3% to $1,944 per ounce after hitting its uh, lowest since April 11th. U.S. gold futures fell 0.6% to $1,947.70 per ounce. Uh, they've uh, since pulled back to, uh, from their lows with spot gold rising 0.2% to $1,953. Meanwhile, U.S. gold futures is down just 0.2% uh, to $1,956 per ounce. On Tuesday, prices fell up to 1.8% as a stronger dollar and rising treasury yields overshadowed inflows into the bullion. We'll take a break now. When we come back, more stories from the African continent. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. Welcome back. Well, the IMF says emerging markets are expected to lose 30% of capital inflows, up from 20% projected in October, driven by 
uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. This Global Financial Stability Report, the IMF explained that the tighter external financial conditions on the back of monetary policy normalization in the United States, together with the heightened geopolitical uncertainty, is uh, likely to increase the downside risk for portfolio uh, flows for such markets. According to the report, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is setting back the global economy and global financial conditions have tightened, uh, notably a downside risk to the economic outlook have increased as a result of, the, uh, of Russia's war in Ukraine. Well, to our first conversation now, the International Monetary Fund has, uh, also, and other rating agencies have released a slew of projections for uh, global economies. And yesterday, the IMF revised upward its growth forecast for the Nigerian economy in 2022 to 3.4% from its earlier projection of 2.7% uh, announced in January. Well, joining us now is Ibukum Omoeni, economist at Vetiva Research. Uh, great to have you, Ibukum. Thank you for having me. Yeah, good yeah so thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon. So we've seen a global, you know, we've seen global growth downgrades, but Nigeria's growth forecast has been upgraded. You know, uh, quite interesting. What's your reaction to this uh, latest outlook? Um, so starting from the global, global aspects, we saw that um, the key factor behind the downgrade of global growth was, of course, the war in Ukraine. And we all know that um, the Ukraine-Russia war has made the headlines throughout um, Q1 2022. Um, so the war in Ukraine is expected to cause an economic contraction across um, Europe and Central Asia. And that's because of the spillover in terms of um, increased commodity prices. Um, food prices are reaching all-time highs. We are seeing food inflation rise to levels um, on a global scale right now, levels that we've not seen in a long time. And of course, that portends um, danger for several economies. Um, and, and another factor which we are seeing is the economic sanctions on Russia considering its um, war in Ukraine. So the sanctions which, I, which we are um, put in place in order to bring Russia to its knees also has its negative impact on the global economy. And of course, we've seen the World Bank um, reduce its forecast by about 0.9% to 3.2%. We've also seen the IMF reduce its forecast by about 0.8% to 3.6%. Um, looking at Nigeria, I believe the key reason for the um, upgrade from 2.7 to 3.4 percent was because of higher oil prices, but I would say I'm, I'm rather more pessimistic than the IMF, and that's because we've seen that um, even though oil prices are rising for the past two years, crude production has been underwhelming. We've, we've been unable to meet our production quota, and now we are getting issues of crude theft. So that creates a lot of uncertainty around um, Nigeria's GDP growth in 2022. That's a we in now at Vetiva believe um, a 2.4 percent forecast is quite moderate, but again, would um, watch and see if um, Nigeria can tackle its good theft issues and ramp up um, oil production so that it can benefit from rising oil prices. So I, I guess your outlook does not, you know, conform with uh, what the IMF is seeing for Nigeria uh, in 2022. But, you know, looking at it from, you know, an African perspective now, what should Africa be doing, you know, now in the face of these economic headwinds? Um, really, so what are the headwinds to start with? I believe the headwinds are rising oil prices and rising food prices, right? One of the ways um, African economies have tried to address rising energy prices in the past was to put in place subsidies. But um, several research has shown that subsidies are actually inefficient and it ends up being, uh, it ends up piling up the fiscal body on the, on the government of such nations. Or on the flip side, removing subsidies is quite a sensitive issue and it could lead to um, uproar and, and social unrest across these economies. So for, for African economies, we expect these economies to put in place in, um, institutions and reforms that could engender foreign direct investment in their economies. And just, you can, just as you can see from the Russia-Ukraine war, a lot of um, economies are beginning, a lot of companies are beginning to rethink supply chains by ensuring that it is not, it is shorter and you could have, you could produce without necessarily have, um, depending on several economies. So over the medium to long term, a lot of investors will be looking at locations to invest in order to ensure that risk is actually mitigated. And of course, African economies can 
take advantage of that of that opportunity and make their economies viable for investment. Another short-term strategy, of course, would be to release food from strategic strategic reserves for countries that have um, food reserves. We've seen, for example, in Egypt. Egypt is one of the countries that is highly dependent on Russia and Ukraine for food imports. And of course, we've seen that in Egypt, the government is trying to intervene by ensuring that bread prices are not too expensive. So it's saying that um, the, the, bread, the, the bread producer should sell to the government. So you see all these measures, uh, they are just short-term measures, but long-term, you need to actually find a way to invest in your agricultural sector, ensure it is able to cater for um, food self-sufficiency within the economy. I believe that's how Africa can address um, that trend over the short to medium term. Uh, quite interesting. But uh, at, the, at the same time, you know, currencies of some emerging economies at risk, you know, right now we're seeing the U.S. dollar, you know, uh, strengthen. But w what is your outlook for, you know, the currencies of most of these emerging economies? Um, so looking at currencies, well, what we've discovered in the recent times is that um, the currencies of economies that are dependent on foreign imports for oil, that is to say those that are net oil importers, they have actually been under a lot of pressure. Take a, a case, for instance, is Ghana, which has depreciated by over 20%. And you, you could actually take a cue from South Africa on the flip side, which has benefited from um, the, 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 the war in that um, South Africa produces a resource that Russia also produces. And of course, because of that um, shock on Russia, there's an increase in the price of that commodity and South Africa actually benefits. So it, it, it's been, it's been I'll, I'll say it, it's been on two sides, right? Rather, those that um, import, those that, ex, those that produce and export commodities that Russia or Ukraine were involved in are benefiting, and those that um, import the commodities that they produce are actually suffering. So that's where you have the, the twin impact. But again, the Russia-Ukraine tension is not the only risk to watch out for. You also have the Fed increasing interest rates, which is another major risk that could actually open um, African currencies. And of course, these African ec economies would have to increase interest rates in order to attract um, portfolio inflows. And of course, that, that should be the strategy, looking at um, emerging market currencies. Well, you know, 2022 has been described as the year of the squeeze. So much to unpack there. Uh, thank you so much, Ibuko Omoeni, economist at uh, Vetifa uh, Research. It was great having you. Thank you for having me. All right, so uh, South, the South African RAND fell to a nearly four-week low, pummeled by a warning of prolonged power cuts, supply chain disruption due to the flooding, and a lower global economic outlook. Opening trade on uh, today at 14 uh, Rand 95 cents to the U.S. dollar. Power utility has come ramped up its rational power cuts to stage failure, and it's uh, estimated that the 2022 load shedding could cost the country's economy 500 million rands per stage uh, day as economic activity comes to a halt uh, during power cuts. Concerns have also risen from devastating floods in the KwaZulu-Natal province, which continue to ravage critical infrastructure and the uncertainty around the war in Ukraine and the prospect of uh, faster Fed interest uh, rate hikes also uh, weighed on the RAND. And that's it, uh, the show today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Bye for now.